Hey, good morning from Overcast, Kansas City, and welcome to Sports Beat Live, our weekly conversation and sometimes therapy session about the Kansas City Royals. We talk with the people in the media who know them best, and today that is beat writer. It's every day, but um, on today's show, uh, beat writer Lynn Worthy, columnist Sam McDowell, and Bahi Gregorian. We're a full house today. Always love it when we are a full house. We are sponsored by the University of Kansas Health System. Uh, you'll hear from them later in the show. And we want to talk with you. Send us your questions and comments. We will get to them um, as they appear on our screen. So um, since the last time we talked, guys, a lot has happened. Chronologically, uh, an All-Star game was played because we talked the day of the All-Star game. Uh, Whit Merrifield was booed at Kauffman Stadium. The Royals took two or three from the Tampa Bay Rays, playoff contending Tampa Bay Rays. They extended that winning streak to three by beating the Angels uh, last night. And we also learned that Salvador Perez is a little bit ahead of schedule on his uh, on recovery from his thumb injury. And Bobby Wood Jr. Um, is not uh, um, – uh, we'll, we'll get an update on his health after having the hamstring injury before. But – the, the the Salvi news, Lynn, that that you um, uh, that you reported on got me thinking. Uh, he's he's starting his rehab assignment tonight in Omaha, and or or, or with Omaha. I don't know where the team's playing, but with Omaha, <clears throat> and <clears throat> and so it got me thinking about what, what how the lineup will be affected when he returns, given what uh, <clears throat> MJ Melendez is doing behind the plate, and of course that that home run he hit last night was. Was tremendous, an opposite field home run. So, anyway, what, what what's an early thought on how this lineup might be affected when Salvador Perez comes back? Well, it's funny that you mentioned Omaha because he's with Omaha, but Omaha's schedule takes them to Syracuse this week, <laughs> and the Royals, after this homestand, head to New York City for four games this weekend. Um, now they haven't given a real timetable on when, you know, how long his rehab stint's going to be or when they expect him back, but it's kind of funny, um, that you, you think about if they were to maybe make some moves with the trade deadline a week away and maybe, unless you're acquiring somebody who's going to go on the major league roster, then that means you'd probably be calling somebody up to fill the roster spot anyway. But if Salvi's a three, four hour drive away and you make that deal, then maybe, Adding him is filling the roster spot instead of you know bringing somebody else up. Um, again, that's speculation because we don't know how long they have him mapped out to be on the rehab assignment. Uh, I think, and actually, it was yesterday after they announced that the Mets also said that uh, Jacob Degrom is going to be doing his rehab assignment with AAA Syracuse. So I think there's a potential tonight, or no, maybe tomorrow night for there to be a Salvador Perez in the lineup rehabbing against Jacob Degrom. Um, but when Salvi does get back, I think that's when, you know, what we saw earlier this year as far as MJ Melendez, where he might get some time at DH, he might get some time in the outfield, because um, we know Salvi's going to catch every day. And also, I think MJ right now, um, I, I looked this up the other day, uh, in the minor leagues, the most games he's caught, not played, because he's played some other positions, DH'd, uh, most games he's caught, I think it was like 81 games in the season, and he's already – closing in on, I think, maybe 20 games shy of that or somewhere in that neighborhood in the big leagues right now. Um, so I don't think it's a bad thing to spread out some of the, that catching for him. Plus, we know Salvi's going to be there every day. It's why it's why the Royals, you know, for a while have been looking for another position for MJ Melendez. I mean, whether it's we've, – we've seen him take grounders at third base. We've seen him actually play out in right field and – um, the interesting thing is he's, you know, he hasn't been great out in right field. I think he has the athleticism to eventually be pretty good out there. Um, obviously, the, the Royals famously moved Alex Gordon out there. It's not like they've never tried to switch a guy positions to fit another prospect in. But um, they're also been playing Hunter Dozier some out in right field. And I don't think they lose anything defensively if, if MJ Melendez is playing right, if the other option is Hunter Dozier. So, um you know, when it comes down to it, you've got to play MJ Melendez every day. I mean, he's a guy that needs at bats every day. He's part of your future, and you know we know where this season's going. So he's he's a guy that needs at bats every day. If Otto's going to be here, he's got to hit. Um, and if Pascantino's going to be here, he's got to hit. So 
it's tough to take any of those three guys out of the lineup, which means I think you're going to have to see MJ Melendez in a different position when Saudi comes back. Yeah, and, and I know this is a you know this doesn't directly affect the the positions we're talking about, but I want to see Rivera every day. I want to see um, I want to see all the, the the rookies or those who are qualified as rookies play every day, and just you know maybe it's a combination of you know, kind of the good vibes. They even though they lost the series in Toronto just before the All Star break, but then come back and um, you know w- win the series against Tampa and get off to a good start last night with the Angels. There's kind of a good vibe after some bad, really bad vibes last week with this with this team. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there's some good vibes right now, and and it's because you know it's because of guys like the, the ones we're talking about, and they're the guy and they're the players you want to see play every day. And, you know, now you look at this Royals team and you got you got some veterans that, you know, are not as popular. And I, I, I kind of look at it like don't don't take it bats away from the future of, of this you know franchise. I want to I want to see these guys. I want to get them developed and, um, and and give them every opportunity to to use the last couple of months of this season to see major league pitching and to. Um, and, and to just you know, be be the future of of the Royals. Uh, meanwhile, on the mound, you know, the, we're, we're, we've been seeing that with you know with, with the with the pitchers, and 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 now it's time to see it with the lineup. Um, Vahe, you with me? You, you want to see this these young Royals um, continue to play? It's really all I want to see. And you know, to to just reiterate the points you guys are making. I mean, they're not just now thinking about when Sal Perez comes back, how to get MJ at bats. I mean, I, I'll be interested to see how it plays out, but there is there. It's a um, got to be part of the master plan, right? That, that they'll have uh, this weaving together of MJ at whatever position with um, Sal back and the young pitchers. I mean, that's really the story of the rest of the season. In a lot of ways, um, we've seen glimpses in a lot of ways out of all of them that tell you they have a chance. And now we're starting to see some leveling out that makes me feel uh, a little sense of hopefulness. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, I just think that the, uh, th- that's what's left for this team. And uh, although I-, I will say uh, they, are, they are not in last place <laughs> today, in the AL Central, uh, I guess that happened actually on uh, on Sunday, moved out of fifth place. Am I right about that, Lynn? Is, I know they're not in last. Uh, they're in fourth by a half game over the Tigers. I don't exactly know where, uh, uh, you know, wh- when it happened. But they're, they're, was it 19-16 over their last 35, which is the best record in the AL Central in that, uh, in that stretch? Yeah, they're moving up, moving up, <laughs> moving on up. That's right. Um, they, uh, I mean, they, they actually have, I think it's, if you go back to the beginning of June, I mean, they're still under 500 um, since that time, but their record is a lot better. Um, and then going into, you know, before Toronto, I think it was three out of four series they had won. Obviously in Toronto, you flip a good chunk of the lineup over, I mean, the roster over, and they, they lost uh, three out of four there, even though they got off to that, you know, that um, energetic start. Um, but then to come back out of the break and take uh, three out of these first four, um, obviously there, you know, there's a little something going there. I mean, um, is it enough to say that they've turned a corner? I don't know about, about that, but I mean, I think it's it's at least, you know, the results have definitely improved. You've seen the, the change there. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, maybe they're starting to, you know, they're starting to get a little bit better and the, the roster is going to pick up a little bit here. If you think about Salvi potentially coming back, um, you think about maybe getting some of the, their pitchers off the IL. Cause right now you're still talking about Daniel Lynch is on the IL. Jonathan Heasley's on the IL. Um, and then, uh, you know, you still have, uh, I mean, Edward Alvarez just went on the IL. So, I mean, there's still guys potentially to um, to fill out this roster, to maybe bolster this roster, and they're starting to play a little bit better right now. I mean, now that's also, you know, part of what Sam was talking about, getting guys in the lineup on a regular basis probably means you got to make some subtractions. And the assumption being that's going to happen at the trade deadline. Um, but it's also not an automatic that when you take some of those guys out, just because you're giving other, the younger guys every day at bats that the, you know, the results won't dip. I mean, cause you're going to be taking 
presumably some of your better guys out of that lineup. I mean, you take Andrew Bantendi out, he's he's probably your best hitter. So, I mean, it's hard to make the case that you're going to get better when you take him out. I mean, you'll get younger, which I think is what people are saying they want, um, but I don't know that you're going to get better. And even though, uh, you know, what Merrifield's numbers for the season haven't been great, you go through from, I think it's like middle of the May on, he's hitting like over 300 and he's been a really productive player. So you take him out. Um, and we've seen that just even this homestand, boot or not, he's still been one of the bigger um, contributors to that offense right now. So um, they might not get better when you subtract those guys, but you'll probably get younger. One other interesting piece about, you know, potentially bringing the younger guys back up is, you know, Mike Matheny and I, and I had a conversation about this, but I think it really benefited those younger guys all coming up together because, I mean, Lynn talked about that the energy was different in the clubhouse in, in Toronto. I don't think that's the case, you know, if you're bringing them up like one at a time. You know, like now just Nick Prado's up, and then, you know, in, in three weeks another guy comes up. I think the fact that they, they're up as a group and, you know, they're basically up with the guys they came up with, that, that they went through the minor leagues with, that that sort of is, is, you know, one of the reasons that a clubhouse was able to take on a new personality, that you felt a new energy in the clubhouse, but also you saw it on the field. Um, I, I, I don't I, I think it'd be interesting to see how these guys performed and um, just how comfortable they were, you know, because that's part of most rookies journeys is you, you're the only guy that gets called up. Um, you know, I think it'd be interesting to see how that works out if if that's the way it goes. If you see a guy traded like like have been attending. I also think, though, that, I mean, at this point, um, some of those guys that you bring up, I mean, even if you only bring up one or two, they're going to they're not going to be bringing up like, you know, eight like they did all at that one point in Toronto. But they're going to be coming into a clubhouse that already has some of those guys because you already have Bobby, um, you know, MJ, Vinny, if Prado's still here. So those guys are already be there and you'll just be adding to that. So they won't all be coming up at the same time, but they'll be joining a group of guys that they've played with you know, probably within the last year. And then obviously some of them, you know, come up and will, are, have, will have already have come up for Toronto and have been there. So, I mean, it's still going to be um, joining a group that they're familiar with. I just don't think that, I mean, if we, if we're talking about bringing up a group, I mean, you're not going to see a group like that when they had those eight guys. Cause I don't think they're going to trade away that many. And even if they do, some of those spots are going to be filled by guys who are injured right now. So, I mean, it's not as though the roster is not expanding. So, I mean, you talk about salary coming back. You're talking about, you know, at some point, all of ours coming back. You talk about some of these pitchers coming back. I mean, those are going to be spots. So there's going to be guys who get, uh, whether they get traded away or guys who get sent back down to make room. There's not that many spots, I don't think, where you're going to be bringing up young guys. It's probably just a couple of spots at best. Okay, so young energy, new energy, however it happens, I want it to continue to happen with this team. And we – Lynn and, and Sam, you guys mentioned it several times now. The trade deadline is it's August second, so if, if I'm not mistaken, that's a week from today. Um, what uh, what is the latest? What what are the what are the latest rumors out there? Um, you know, ben Intendi still, uh, I still see his name attached to different teams. I and I hear new teams, right? I hear the Atlanta Braves lost their left fielder uh, this weekend, right? And so uh, add the Braves to the list and. Um, could could there be something of a you know a, a bidding process, a bidding war for for Andrew Benintendi, Lynn? Well, um, I've always thought that they were going to try and extract the most for him, and that meant it was going to go down to the deadline. Because as you get close to the deadline, teams sort of get more desperate. Um, teams have to, you know, you, I mean, deadlines as we know always make things happen that forces people's hands. Um, and so, if there's teams that are you know maybe not willing to add. Um, something else to sweeten the pot or if there's another team that's you know has to make a move as you get close to the deadline to try and make a playoff push and then gets in on it I think it only raises the the, the potential return for Ben Intendi uh, and also I just I never bought into I mean like there was I think it was in going into Toronto with the whole vaccination thing this idea that well now that he's people know he's not vaccinated that, that some teams might be out on him I never bought into that one because I felt like people knew that if they were interested in him to begin with. And then my understanding was that like, there was that one report that the, you know, the Yankees, oh, they're out on him. And then I think even within the last week, they said, oh, well, the Yankees are back in on him. Well, the, my, the understanding that I had was that they never were out. And that even after that report, they may have even made it known that they weren't out to folks at the Royals. So I, I'm, I don't think that ever changed the interest in him. I think it's just a matter of what they want in return for him. 
Well, there's one other wrinkle that came out yesterday with the Ben attending stuff, which is, I mean, the the players union rejected MLB's proposal for the international draft. And the other piece of that was getting rid of the qualifying offer. So, you know, there, there is the option that if Ben attendees on whoever's roster is on at the end of the year, they offer him a qualifying offer. And if he turns it down, they get a, they get a comp pick for it. So, Somewhere around, you know, the the low 30s, you've got to have a better offer than that. Well, I don't, if, and I have to go back and look, but I think he, I don't think they could get, like, if he, they trade him to whoever, New York, I don't think New York could still get the qualifying offer for him. I think he had to, he would have to be on your roster for the year. So I think yeah. the Royals could get, yeah. yeah, the Royals could get the comp pick. Um, and there was, you know, the, it, well, they would have to make the qualifying offer too, though. And I'm, um, I'd question whether or not they would just because I think last year that number was 18.4 million or something like that. So, I mean, because you make that offer <laughs> and there's also the chance that Benny signs it and then you got to pay him a, you know, $19 million next year. I mean, obviously he probably wants to check, you know, try for agency and, and, and see what else he could get out there. But I'm saying, I, I'm just not sure that the qualifying offer is um, a slam dunk that they would make that and, and roll that dice. But um, yeah, I think it was the idea that maybe they would have got a comp or some. It might have added to their international draft. It, it does change the calculus as far as that because I think the Royals at least were taking the stance in some ways that hey, we don't have to trade him. That we could you know hold on to him and then it's going to benefit us in some way afterwards. Um, I think part of that thinking was maybe even with the international draft comp the the qualifying offer thing, I think maybe changes a little bit. Yeah. I, I do think they'd offer him the qualifying. So I, I do think they're probably telling teams you, you, this is the bar. You, you have to beat something we feel like we could get, you know, in, in, in the low thirties there. Hey, the only, the only thing I wanted to add, just because any chance I get to use this line, I feel like I need to use it is that to Lynn's point about waiting to get the best deal. Um, there's a big difference between procrastinating and taking all the time you have. And uh, that that's, you know, to the Royals' benefit here. That's all. Thanks for letting me get that in, Blair. <laughs> right. um, Kevin Martin has the last word before we go to break. Uh, asks, do you think it's likely that other interested teams knew Benintendi was unvaccinated before the Toronto series? We, we do, right, Lynn? That's, um, yeah. Um, yes, that information was known through ba throughout baseball. Um, Darren, Darren Winters wants to trade all the veterans who gave up in April. I like that as well. All right. Uh, we, we've got more to talk about, but we're going to take a break first. And let's hear from the University of Kansas Health System. March 4th, 2015, I got out of the shower and felt a lump in my left breast. We were able to quickly uncover that she had two subtypes of breast cancer, each of them requiring separate and unique treatment plans. This is why you come to the University of Kansas Cancer Center. It is critical to be treated by a team of experts in that specific cancer type. If you don't start with us, I think you'll have more questions than answers. Why would you go anywhere else? So I believe I was muted before we went into that break there. Uh, Sorry about that, um, Kevin Martin. Yeah, okay. So I think we got to that. We, we got to our reader comments. So um, let's let's touch on this quickly. I know all three of you were at the ballpark. I say I know that. Um, I'm assuming all three of you were at the ballpark on Friday when the Royals came home after the All Star break for the first game. Uh, when when Whit came to bat, uh, Whit Merrifield and, and was booed. I, I you know what, what was the percentage of of those who booed? What could could you? Could you tell? Was it was it easy to, to determine that? You know, I, Lynn and I had a conversation about it because I thought the boos were louder. But also, if, if you know, you've got the the wherewithal or, I, you know, the, if, if you came to boo with Mary, because you're probably pretty loud. And if you, you chose to cheer him, you probably did it a little bit more quietly. So I think it was somewhere around 50-50. You know, I know the boos were louder, but, you know, fan-wise, I, I bet it was somewhere around 50-50. I was just more curious than anything. I, I don't remember another occasion where uh, a player at Kauffman, a home, you know, Royals player at Kauffman Stadium was was booed. And uh, it's interesting you say that, Blair, because I reached out to a bunch of our former beat writers, like Bob Dutton, Andy McCullough, uh, talked to Jeff Flanagan. I mean, 
multiple people and say, can, can you tell me the last time you remember a Royals player booed? And, you know, there was some thought that, you know, some relievers when they blew leads in the moment, they got booed off the mound. Um, but just a premeditated thing like that, I, it, you know, none of them could really recall any incident. That's the key point here too, Sam. I think that's pretty interesting, the premeditated aspect, because that I think the example you pointed to in your column was the one we all remember, of course, of a uh, spontaneous reaction to Ned Yost uh, yeah. in 2014 after the wild card uh, uh, impending fiasco that was averted. There was also the uh, the Luke Hochaver on opening day. I can't remember the year. Was it uh, 11 or 12, perhaps? Uh had given up five runs before getting an out in the first inning. And then the booze from a full house, of course, because it's opening day rained down on, on the Royals and Luke Hoche for that day. So, okay. Vahe had a nice weekend in Cooperstown, New York, and uh, was there for the Buck O'Neill Hall of Fame ceremony. Must have been pretty cool, Vahe, to, to be part of that. Great interviews with all the folks who needed to be talked. I, I saw where there was a panel discussion there as well with um, with uh, with our Joe Posnanski and Bob Kendrick and uh, Bob Costas, I believe, was part of that. Lee Smith may be part of that as well. How about take us through your weekend in Cooperstown and what was um, you know what was that like? Well, listen, it, it it was terrific and and maybe a little more so for me since I hadn't been to Cooperstown before. Um, and you know, one of the things about Cooperstown, I, I flew to Albany and then drove there. Um, and about the last 45 minutes of the drive, it reminds you, uh, that baseball is a pastoral game because it's, you're going into that setting. That's, uh, very much farmland. And, uh, I think just sets kind of a nice tone for your arrival in Cooperstown. Um, and you're right, Blair, that, that panel discussion to me, in a lot of ways, that was one of the highlights of the weekend because, just think about the sort of star power there. I mean, Bob Costas, Joe Posnanski, and Bob Kendrick, I would submit that they are uh, really three of the great storytellers of our time, all of whom have intimate knowledge of baseball and this story in particular. And uh, our friend Joel Goldberg really did a great job um, getting the right questions in front of them and, and I think setting the tone for it. Um, it was also nice, by the way, John Sherman of the Royals, co-hosted that event and was really part of all this. In fact, even wearing a Monarchs hat on Sunday at the, uh, at the induction. So they, 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 I think added a lot of insight and light to the story. And um, on Sunday uh, it, it, it was um, a, a really cool setup. I, I would be lying if I didn't say, I felt like it was a little, Bit of a bummer that Bob Kendrick didn't get to be Buck, Buck's presenter. Uh, it was a relative of Buck's, uh, Angela Terry, a niece, and she she was fine. But I think it was the case of a person um, giving a little bit of a family perspective on something that we all see as as broader and bigger than that. And again, it, not in any way to criticize her. It's just that it felt like that was a moment Bob Kendrick was born for. And uh, I, I, I wish he'd had that opportunity. It was just following Hall of Fame protocol, basically, that led to that. Um, Bob, of course, is uh, always so kind with his time. And, and even after that, made a point of uh, visiting with me and a couple other reporters uh, off to the side. And I think really amplified the story in, in, a, in yet another way. That's one of his great gifts that he can uh, go over a lot of the same terrain and tell it uh, with different twists and turns and, and points of color. Um, so that, that was pretty great. And just one only other thing I'd add at, 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 from that question, Blair, is that uh, I happened to travel back with Bob and, and uh, uh, his great associate, Keona Sinks, yesterday. And it was amazing to see Bob everywhere from the Albany airport to the airplane itself to the Baltimore airport. Basically, all these rooms become his rooms. People gravitate to him want to hear what he has to say, uh, even if they quite don't quite put the pieces together. Like, oh, oh, did you go to the Hall of Fame? And he just kind of explains, yeah, I was there. Uh, I was good friends with Buck O'Neill. Um, anyway, he's, he's just a 
portrait of uh, Grace in all these situations. And and uh, I, I thought extra fun to travel with them back. Buck O'Neill, of course, was baseball's great ambassador. But who, who is you know who's a better ambassador for baseball now than than Bob Kendrick? He, he's just he, he's wonderful. And for those of us who were fortunate to to have met Buck O'Neill and, um, and and to sit around and talk baseball with him and, and be mesmerized by his stories, Bob Kendrick is you know I'm not going to say he's Buck's equal when it comes to storytelling. But if you ever have an opportunity to tour the Negro Leagues Museum on 18th and Vine and, um, and, and, and Bob is leading that tour, uh, it's something you'll never forget. It, it is an incredible experience. And um, just noticed on Twitter a little while ago that the angels got to some angels got to experience that uh, on, uh, I, I guess, uh, yesterday afternoon. So it is um, uh, we are, we're so fortunate to have. The, the museum and Bob Kendrick here in town. Blair, I would just add, and we've all been fortunate to get to know Bob um, and get to know the Negro Leagues Museum, uh, Baseball Museum story. But I'd, I'd urge any of our listeners to uh, uh, do a little search for Sam McDowell's piece on, uh, on, on what it's like to get the tour from Bob. And Sam, maybe you can expand on what that, what that experience was like. But it, 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 it was a great, great story that told the story of the story. Yeah, Blair and I did that. It was like we got uh, – Blair, I don't remember how many tours you went on. I think I went on like seven, and you went on like three or four maybe. Yeah. And what what I think is probably the, the best way to describe just how enjoyable it is is you still want to go and see it an eighth time with, with Bob. I mean, I've always told people you should go through and see the Negro Leagues Museum regardless, but seeing it with Bob guiding it is just a completely different experience. Um, he is – I, 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 I told Vahe this once, but there's no person that I personally know who is better suited for the job they have than Bob Kendrick for the job he has. I mean, it's just absolutely um, amazing the way he brings, you know, a, a museum to life. I mean, there's an energy of, about a museum that, you know, typically you don't get when you walk through museums. You know, it's typically a personal experience. And with, with him, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, you feel in it with everybody that's part of your tour. I mean, it's an ongoing conversation and just, I, I, I he's seriously hear a story from him every time I go that I hadn't heard before. And I'm like, why didn't you include that in the last one? I mean, it's just, it's incredible stuff. And Lynn, with Lynn, gosh, you were over there the night that uh, this announcement came, weren't you? Lynn's got the uh, sweatshirt on. He's right. Re- we, we need to mention that he's repping it. Yeah. The, um, uh, this is actually, I think this one was at a CC Sabathia did a collection of uh, different shirts that um, was for the, the hundred year anniversary. So I'm pretty sure that's what, what this one came out of. There's this and there's a Jackie Robinson um, uh, uh, long sleeve tee that I got as part of that. But yeah, I was there the night um, they had the watch party at the museum with Bob sort of hosting it. And, um, you know, it was MLB TV or MLB network that, um, you know, was broadcasting the announcement and just a room full of people waiting to see if Buck would get in this time. And in that room included, you know, Frank White, uh, Joe Carter, um, local, you know, um, uh, political figures, you know, Mayor Lucas, a, a lot of people, you know, and then just, yeah, I think there was some of uh, Buck's family and, you know, just local people who were interested in whether or not he was going to get there. And, before they even got to the name, just the fact they started reeling off like, you know, the um, the resume and everybody realized it's Buck and you could hear, I don't think you ever heard the name, you know, John Buck O'Neill. I don't think, I think you heard that. I think you just heard, you know, the resume and then the room go crazy. And then you saw Bob, you know, almost instantly in tears. And it was, it was just a really cool moment to be there for that. Um, I think there was a sentiment throughout the room that, you know, there was a lot of joy. There was a little bit of bittersweetness because people were like, it should have been when Buck was still around to see it. But at the same time, people were like, they, I think the, one of the quotes is probably said multiple times, but I'm sure I quoted at least one person talking about they um, undid a wrong. Yes. Yes, they did. Um, yeah. 
you know, should have happened in what, 06? I can't remember the exactly, 07? I can't remember the year, but yeah, but it's happened and let's uh, uh, let's be happy that, that it did. So um, yeah, Sam, I, I enjoyed uh, working on that story back then. I, I, I toured with the Philadelphia Phillies who were in town and I just remember keeping an eye on Andrew McCutcheon uh, as he was probably standing as close to Bob as anybody throughout the tour and was mesmerized by uh, by, by Bob and just enthralled by, by the whole thing. And it was, uh, th that's what made it fun for me. Not just, I had heard the tour, I'd been on the tour before and heard it, but to see the major league players react to it the way they did, um, you know, gripped by, by, by Bob Kendrick's narrative. It was, it was wonderful to see. So Steve asked where we can find a, col a copy of that column. I'll tell you what I'll do, Steve. We, we turn this into a podcast that gets posted on KansasCity.com and I'll, I'll find that column and I'll link to it. So we'll have it uh, on the uh, on, on the sh on the story for the podcast that appears on KansasCity.com later today. So, okay, guys, great conversation as always. Lynn, Sam, Vahe, thank you so much. Monty Davis, our producer, does a terrific job, and Kevin, Darren, Steve, Matt, thanks for uh, for for weighing it. And Matt, Matt asks if it's if it's possible to get a a tour from, um, you know, from Bob. I don't know if it works that way. I just don't know. Um, I think if, 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 if the Negro leagues ever want a museum, ever wanted to have, uh, an amazing fundraiser, I bet you could have a Bob Kendra tour and charge a thousand dollars a ticket and sell it out, um, for, for people. It, it, it's, it's that wonderful an event. So, um, okay guys, thanks a lot. Thanks, Monty. We'll see you guys next Tuesday.